Hi, so today's lecture is a very interesting one. It's about the principle of individuality or what's also sometimes called individualism. And if you have to ask me in my career and probably a lot of uh, people out there in the field of strength and conditioning and maybe in other fields as well, if they have used and if I have specifically used one principle which maybe has made the most difference to my success that I have achieved with uh, training athletes and even the general population, then probably this is the principle. So to explain this principle and to get a bit further so that you know what are some of these um, laws that you can follow. Okay. To understand this first, let's just look at this picture on the slide. Okay. I want you to look at this picture and gather information. What do you see in this picture? So obviously, common sense will tell you that there's a group of people. There are different people out there. There are boys, there are girls. Then you will see that some of them are slightly built differently. If you see this person here, he's got quite broad shoulders. You can make out looking at his arms. Maybe he does train, has a pretty flat stomach. Okay pretty flat uh, waist. You see these girls, uh, this girl and this girl are slightly built differently. Maybe the shoulders are different. Hip ratio is slightly different. Here's a boy and here's a girl. There's a difference in race. Definitely we can observe, right? Here's somebody else. Again, a different race. You can make out the height is slightly different to this person. So in this whole group, as we see, we obviously can make out that each one here two, three, they are different, right? And this might sound like something very common sense, but like they say, sometimes common sense is not very common. And a lot of times, coaches, strength coaches, a lot of people make this mistake of getting into generalization, okay? So if there's something which is the exact opposite of this principle, where we talk about individuality or individualism, then the exact opposite will be generalization. So if I have to just look at this group from, for example, and if I have to say that, oh, this is a group of people, they all like to eat non-vegetarian food. They all like pizza. And at home, they all have the same rooms. Uh, they like to exercise all of them. They like sunshine. They like to party. Just looking at them, if I have to generalize, then obviously it doesn't make sense because each one is an individual. And the whole principle of individualism is based on this fact that we are all individuals. Now, if we look at us as, you know, dividing different people according to races or countries, yes, there are certain um, places where, you know, we are similar. And by that, I mean when somebody has to prove their maybe residency, which country are you from? How does one decide that? Is it by the look that this person looks maybe Indian or this person looks uh, American? Is that how we prove where you belong? No, obviously. There's a document, right? You would have a passport, you would have maybe an Aadhaar card, a driving license. So there's proof. And especially a passport when you travel overseas into another country at the border or at the airport, you have something to show. So that makes the difference as, okay, this is an American, this is an Indian, this is a South African, this is maybe somebody from Australia. So there is a document which gives all these people the same rights, okay, and the same laws apply to them. Now when we talk about people from a sports perspective, can we say that all Indians are the same, all Americans are the same, or that we all are humans and then obviously we're all same. We just share certain qualities which are all the same. So the whole idea behind this start is to make you understand that we are all individuals and if we need any more proof of that, our fingerprints, those are probably more than enough, right? How do people... Uh, how do the uh, police and how do the uh, criminal investigation departments, how do they uh, make sure when they have to catch a criminal, what do they use? Fingerprints. We don't have the same fingerprints. How can we have the same bodies? 
interesting point, isn't it? Think about it because this is very important to understand. And if you can understand this, you can really say that you are going onto a path where you will be able to create things which actually help that particular individual rather than just creating generic workout programs or generic statements or generic beliefs that this is what these people need. Okay, So let's delve uh, a bit further into this principle and let's try to understand a bit more about this. So here we have a few different principles you know, or rather within the principle of individuality, what are the differences that exist in people? So there's generally five and there can be more as well, but these are the major five that we can look at. One is age, okay, and then there's gender, okay, are you man or woman? Uh, next is height and somatotypes, SNC and sport experience, economic status, food culture, right? So these are the main ones. We will be going into each of them and then trying to gain some more knowledge how people are different from each other. So when we talk about age and gender difference, right, we all know that people at different ages are different. When you were 10 years old, you were different physically. When you were 15, you are different. When you are 20, you are different. So obviously the main difference that one can see is that as you grow okay, and as you are at a certain age and especially in the age group of 10 to 13 years, you are not an adult. That's again common sense. We all know. Now, at that age, what is it that as a strength and conditioning specialist, you would have to focus on if an athlete of that age comes to you or even a regular player, you know, who's maybe not competing. What is it that you have to look at them, look or rather get out of them and then you can help them. So some things to notice is that, you know, this is when there's a good growth spurt. Girls generally in this age group, will grow a bit taller, okay, faster than the boys. And sometimes you will see that a girl just shoots up and then the boys maybe don't grow as much. But this is when they tend to have that difference in um, size. You know, the girl will be a slightly uh, taller person uh, compared to a boy of maybe the same age. Okay, But again, we can't make this statement and just generalize that this happens everywhere. But generally, this is what is seen. The other thing when we work with athletes of this age or even youngsters, we have to be very aware that the directions given for exercise at this age have to be very clear. A lot of youngsters at this age are not able or they have mentally not yet developed to be able to take clear decisions and sometimes even to understand what you say. So you might be very good in your programming, you might know exactly what you're doing. Teaching is one thing. You have to find out if the person is learning and these are two different things, right? You can be very good at teaching but you have to have somebody who learns from you and if they're not able to learn from you, then are you a good teacher? What do you have to do at that point then? You have to modify, you have to tweak it according to that age group. So this is extremely important to understand. We can't have the same standard pattern of teaching for somebody who's 13 or 10 and somebody who's 20 years old. This point makes it easier for us to teach this age group and sometimes this age group they are also just getting out of childhood and just getting into becoming uh, somebody who can move better, their movement patterns are better. So sometimes they have a lot of these issues maybe in their minds okay, that they might be uh, not liked in an age group amongst their friends or maybe sometimes you know. Uh, they feel that they are probably uh, down when they are not performing well. So these are things that we have to understand at that age group and a psychologist, especially in the psychology lessons, you'll be learning a lot more about this. But this is just to brush up on those areas. How do we make sure that their mental state and the physical state we are able to handle? So when it comes to the physical state, these are young children, they are not adults. So we have to be very careful of the exercise selections. You don't want them to be doing something which they start hating later on okay, or something which creates so much pressure that later on they have uh, injuries due to this or maybe you know they go through uh, probably bad experiences at a young age. So we have to be very clear about this. Now the second point, middle adolescence. Okay, are people different here? Of course, a person who's between the age of 14 to 16 would be slightly different to somebody who's um, 10 to 13. 
At 14 to 15, the kid is obviously more grown up, right? They are able to exercise with a bit more intensity. Do they need direction? Absolutely, yes. At this age, one of the things that we will also see is that there's a lot of peer pressure. 14 to 16 is that age group generally when kids are anywhere between um, sort of 7 standard in the Indian schooling system to approximately maybe 10 uh, in the 10th or maybe in the 11th as well. So there's a lot of school pressure also that comes in. Sometimes this is the time they would like to take a break uh, because they have to appear for their exams. Okay, So at that time the loading patterns has to be adjusted according to their requirements as well. Then comes late adolescence. Okay, Now late adolescence is when youngsters move on to grow from around 16 to 20. By 20 years they are generally physically mature with some changes still happening. This is the age where you can slowly from a strength and conditioning perspective start adding those principles of a slight hard training which is such as uh, using the strength, uh, strength training uh, modes where you are lifting heavy under observation obviously, uh, power training which again is, has some speed movements but all under observation because though they are uh, grown up they still need observation all the time. So late adolescence is where really these uh, youngsters also start making plans for their future. By the time they are 18, they also want to know which direction of education they are going into. Something interesting that happens here is also for us as coaches, for the administrators and sometimes even for the parents and the youngsters themselves. This is an age group where they are also knowing how good they are, if we may call it, in that particular sport. So if somebody has been playing a sport such as a cricket or badminton, tennis, whichever sport, by the time you are 16 and especially by the time you are 18, depending on what level you are playing, are you still a district level player, are you still competing in school or have you started winning medals at the state level, have you been a record holder? Uh, or by the time you're 20. So it gives them uh, and it gives us a bit of perspective as to what is the potential that might we can expect. Again, can we precisely say that okay at this age you have to be able to do this and then you should uh, do sport? Obviously not because again there are some people who are late bloomers. It also depends on which sport. Okay, If you are in a sport which is not very physically demanding, of course, the body can last a lot longer. So some people can even start performing well at the age of 25, maybe even 26, depending on the sport. Most physically demanding sports though, such as athletics, swimming, uh, rugby, there you would normally see that this age becomes almost like one of the, the beginning of the peak age and sometimes goes up to 25 with good sports science support, with good uh, system of uh, loading. It can of course extend to even 30 or so. Uh, sometimes nowadays you see uh, people are able to uh, hold their bodies on and play longer almost up to the age of 35. But generally between this age you get an idea of the person's potential. Next point, what do we have to take into consideration when we train a female athlete, a girl who is training? Menstrual cycles and we have to be knowing about this as coaches. Because we have to be understanding what that girl is going through. If she is having body pains, mentally are there any sort of concerns, you know, does she feel down? It is always good to know this and it is always important that there is a medical professional involved somewhere. So if there is anything which is going maybe just not in tune with what is generally expected because this is more to, than the coach. This is something where a good doctor will come in, a good pediatrician will come in. Okay, So then they know that there is good health going on as well. What should not be done by coaches is obviously to make that girl think like, okay, this is a problem or to think that, you know, uh, this is something which you shouldn't make too much of a scene. Okay, Of course, no sports person would want to perform bad in a sport, especially due to um, a cycle that they are having. But we need to understand as coaches that we don't have to make it worse and we don't have to have an opinion which is negative. It is part of a, a girl's growth 
and we have to be very very understanding we have to upgrade our knowledge so we know what uh, this is and there's enough info out there in uh, on the internet on some good books there are websites which uh, deal with this especially for sports women so we have to get into understanding this so that we can create programs which are appropriate for a woman athlete when they are having their monthly cycles again here important to understand and probably makes sense that when you are working with a female athlete and she is having her monthly cycle what is the right way to deal with that particular girl okay or her training load you have to adjust your whole training according to that particular person some girls will have body ache some girls will have back pain some girls will feel down some might not some might just know be okay with it and so, still sort of be able to train a bit some will who have maybe heavy bleeding it will be different so what do we have to do we have to adjust according to that particular athlete we can't say that this is what we do and you have to adjust okay so this will be getting into more points about this but understand that you have to adjust make that person the best and the most comfortable they can be in the given circumstances but don't make it worse okay next point is between boys and girls should boys and girls train the same okay especially as they are growing do they have the same structures now girls over time it has been found that their leg strength is almost uh, not exactly the same as men but generally very similar and close to men and boys but when we check upper body strength and do comparison there's a clear difference that men and boys are stronger so we have to take into account that training a girl and training a boy of the same age let's say there's a 16 year old girl and a 16 year old boy should they be squatting the same weight should they be doing the same amount of push ups especially as their bodies start growing and as they become a man and a woman can you just train them the same way we have to take this into consideration we can't say that everyone here is a sports person you're a boy you'll be treated the same you're a girl you'll be treated the same physiologically they are different physically they are different even mentally they are different so there's a very interesting saying that boys and girls men and women are equal but they are different so we have to understand this point and make sure that our training methods take note of this consideration and this difference between the two genders now the next difference um, is everybody the same height when we see people again common sense answer is obviously no okay uh, people have different heights some people are just tall they just grow very tall some people are maybe not as tall some people are very thin some people put on weight easily so what what is it that uh, makes them be like this okay so there's a type of uh, definition which has been created which makes it easier for us to define different body types so there's what's called the ectomorphic body okay and you can you should definitely read up more about this and this will also help you uh, understand some body types so you might have an ectomorph who's there with you who generally will be somebody with a uh, very thin uh, bone frame you will find their wrists to be small their ankles to be small uh, they don't put on weight easily they tend to generally have a bit of high energy you know slightly uh, more energetic to do something or sometimes maybe you can say a bit more hyper uh, but generally they are slim they have a lot of energy to go on what do they not have is size okay this body type is something which uh, is, will normally be seen as something which is slim more like a marathon runner's body okay very lean doesn't have much muscle mass putting on size becomes quite a problem but losing weight is not an issue in fact many of them would be losing weight very quickly if they don't train they lose weight they become thin so that is an ectomorphic body what is a mesomorph okay a mesomorph is somebody who is that kid in your cl class when you grew up okay who's just got muscles okay just literally born you know they just have muscles popping out they have these broad shoulders chest looks like an athlete and generally these are the ones who excel good in power sports and 
one might say that how do they become like this? Just born like that. Okay. So a lot of the physical qualities of such uh, people, they're just born and that's the mesomorphic structure. They are what may be called a coach's ideal package that you would want. You would want an athlete to be somebody who's fast, somebody who has good uh, muscle strength, who gains strength fast, who has good power and who has a uh, good combination of athletic qualities. Now, a mesomorph, somebody who's got this structure, uh, does it mean that because they have this, they will win in every sport? Think about it. Would it help just being fast and naturally gifted in a sport which requires a lot of skill? Say table tennis, which has a lot of hand and eye coordination. Badminton, okay, which again has a lot of hand eye coordination, speed, a lot of deception. Okay, stop start. So where skill plays a high role and where there's an implement use like what we had discussed uh, in the um, previous lectures, being a mesomorph can help you be fast, okay? But if there's an implement, it can still, somebody who's weaker than you can still probably beat you, okay? Being a mesomorph will help more in sports which are to do with their own physique, swimming, uh, athletics, wrestling, where it's all about controlling and having that extra sort of power, it definitely can give you a boost. So we have to again understand what type of body type has an advantage and where. It is not that just uh, having an ectomorphic structure will make you a great uh, long distance runner and it, to say that no, a mesomorph will just become good in any sport which is out there. So we have to understand that different structures help in different sports but we have to understand that these structures exist and you will come across this more and more as you start seeing and coaching more in this field. Next comes the endomorph. The endomorph is uh, the structure where you will generally find that there's a lot of um, adipose tissue that these um, structures gain. So they, even if they eat a little, they're just a bit more on the bigger side, uh, put on fat faster, have trouble losing weight. Uh, if they do lose weight, then they can also become big and strong, but uh, it is generally tougher for them compared to others to lose weight. Uh, they can be very strong because of the thicker bone size, uh, sometimes more bone density as well. But uh, at the same time, they don't have the uh, in-between balance of a mesomorph who's neither skinny or who's neither on the larger side. So if you have to categorize these three, you can think of a skinny, thin athlete who finds it hard, the muscular in-between who just seems to be perfect in everything. And then you have the one who's slightly on the larger side, who's slightly maybe slower, okay. They can all train and we have to understand this, that all of these can train and become fitter. But if we're just looking at say from a point of muscle building, the mesomorph will generally have the biggest advantage because he or she will just build muscles very fast. And again, we will see, you know, a lot of personal trainers, uh, strength coaches, they find some guys, you know, they are friends. They just go to the gym, join for maybe two months and you just see muscles popping and their arms are big, their shoulders are good. They just don't have to work too hard and they just seem to have such great bodies that they can build. So these are those mesomorphic structures and you are just, you know, born. It's, it, it just comes. It sometimes runs in a family. You will find that, you know, the father would have a good structure. Uh, the mother would maybe also have. So then the child also has some very good genetics that come in. So these have to be taken into account. We have to understand that this exists, okay? Next comes now the height and exercise loading. Height of a person will definitely make a difference in certain exercises. A very tall person, if we are going to make them do a lot of hip flexion movements, the loading on the back becomes one of the issues, okay? Also taller people, if they are going to do overhead lifts, we have to understand very simple that that bar has to travel a greater distance for a tall person versus somebody who's shorter than them. So a shorter person, if they have to lift a bar, it is traveling less height. A taller person has to take it to a greater height. A shorter person will also be able to do some exercises like squats. You will notice that they can really do it with good technique, very quick, simply because they can hold the bar, they can get down, squat down, squat up. There's a lesser distance that the bar travels. So these are again considerations, okay? And of course, height, you will notice that some sports, tall people, uh, tall kids, it just becomes very natural for them. 
simply because the taller person can play basketball better. So there was this myth many years ago, you know, that people thought that playing basketball makes you tall. It's rather the other way. Tall people play basketball because the net is uh, the um, where they uh, shoot. Uh, that becomes easier for them compared to somebody who's shorter. So we have to take this into account and then understand that some things you're born with, some things you can train, but you can't train everything, okay? And a lot of times you can't be born with everything as well, but we have to understand what we can do and what we can't as well. The next difference that happens, okay, when we design programs, what is it that we have to take into consideration? So one is whether the person's a beginner, somebody who's just started training, especially weight training, okay? Would they have the experience? Can you confidently tell them this is the exercise pattern do? Of course not, you know. So there are two uh, areas here you have to realize. There's somebody who has fitness experience who could have been training in a gym, has been doing fitness. And then you also have to take into account somebody who has sport, the technical experience. So these are two different verticals, right? They are not the same. Somebody can be very experienced in this and started playing sport a bit later or the other way around, right? So when we first now look at just the fitness part, okay, uh, if you find that there's someone who comes to you, so how do you know whom to train and how much uh, load to put? Thing to realize is that you take the beginner, and I'm just going to you know uh, use the pen to show you here now. Now this is the beginner, right? You want this beginner to be able to do movement patterns which are explained clearly. They have to be explained, okay? Very, very important. A lot of beginners sometimes can even feel a bit sort of, you know, embarrassed to ask because they feel like, oh, I don't know. So it is our job to tell them. You can be, they might look, if, especially if they have a mesomorphic structure, they might look as if they are very experienced, but they might not be. So you have to understand, a beginner is generally somebody you can define as somebody who has trained for less than three to six months, okay? In, in strength and conditioning or in the gym. So between three to six months, they are still beginners because they are still getting their technique right. They are still understanding. They are still understanding how their body responds, okay? Then comes somebody who's got intermediate experience, okay? This is a person you can say, you know, who's been training for approximately from around one year to um, two years, okay? They've, they've been in training. So here you can say from beginner can be up to even one year. You can say the first year of training, they're still beginners. After around total three years, between two and three, when they complete three years, they become good intermediate trainees. Here is somebody who has more than three years of experience, advanced, okay? Obviously, these three would have different um, responses to exercise prescription. The advanced person obviously knows when you explain something, this is what we're doing, we're doing jumps, we're doing heavy loading or we're doing uh, endurance training or we're doing different isometric holds. They can understand because they've gone through this. They've also experienced those programs and seen the results of it. And they might also know what uh, heavy lifting can do, how some lifts can be risky, some uh, explosive movements would have probably, they've gone through their fair share of strains, sprains, so they would have an experience, but a beginner wouldn't. So when we design programs, it is important to understand where they fit in and take their experience into account. Now, interestingly, the sport side, okay, need not match. So somebody who's a beginner in sport might be very advanced in the exercise in the gym. And somebody who's very technically very good, sometimes you have these athletes who come who are very good, exceptional, but they have never been much to the gym. Okay, so the approach has to be independent of each other. If somebody comes to you who's a high achiever, don't expect them to be very advanced in their training in the gym. When you design programs, you have to understand that this is different and then this is different. Okay, you cannot just think that, oh, you are so good, you're a national champion or maybe you've gone for international matches. So this is the training program we're doing because this will make you this, this, this and it will make you explosive. You have to still go through the a periodization sort of uh, plan so that there's a goal that can be achieved safely and systematically. Interestingly, sometimes you will notice that, and this is again a point of wisdom you should note, this will help you a lot. A lot of players who are sometimes very highly skilled 
are not sometimes the most physically strong okay when it comes to high skill sports and sometimes the ones who are not technically very skilled would end up using their physical prowess to push through because they are not maybe as good technically it's very rare to have somebody who has both very high level of skills and very high levels of fitness and you will see this in uh, a lot of these high skill sports and again i bring the example of badminton where you might find some people with very good strokes okay and they might not appear the most fittest and there might be some players who would be very fit who who would have that you know natural ability they're just born strong train a bit get stronger but their game might not be the most technically uh, beautiful if you may call it for a pure uh, sort of purest of badminton to say okay so we have to understand this our role though should not come from these judgments whether somebody plays amazing or not we have to take into account how the body is and give them a program according to if they're beginners intermediate or advanced and once we give this program then we have to make sure that it is helping them over here in the sport if it's not helping we've gone through this before is it worth it is what you have to ask yourself now the next point very important extremely important probably never brought up you won't learn this in most uh, courses right and that's why this course becomes so important and so effective because it's not just a course which teaches you about strength and conditioning it teaches you what to do in strength and conditioning and rather what not to do as well economic status financial status of an athlete so just to give you um, maybe example okay which will make you think let's say there's an academy where there's uh, swimmers who come and one swimmer comes in a car chauffeur driven car uh, this food which is brought which is ready so that when they're eating there's everything is ready they travel back in a car ac car they go back to their room they have their own room to stay there's an aircon if it's a hot city they are in the ac they go to a international school which has again aircon uh, the food is never a problem okay parents are pretty well settled in life and have enough funds so there's one student like this and there's another swimmer who comes maybe you know by bus because it's not very close then they have to walk a bit they have to carry their uh, stuff with them there's no driver food they eat in a canteen they can't eat what they want because at home maybe the financial status is not as um, strong as the other swimmer now when they come to the gym here somebody who's walked okay in the sun and has walked to the gym has not had the best meal uh, is structurally you can make out no nutrition is probably not at its best and here somebody who is coming in a car who's got everything organized you know you you tell them to do something a nice but they can this person can't afford to do it now should your training program be the same should you have a program which says in the gym this is the program for today everybody here okay and when these students come and you say like somebody says i'm tired today this person says because they probably walked more they had to do a few things like you know they had to go to college again by bus then take an auto and this person said i'm tired today because i i had to go to college so i don't care if you end up saying and you become that coach okay the one who's like okay i don't care when you come here leave your problems out you come inside the gym you follow my program and the program is here written on the wall this is what you do 1 2 3 i don't care how you feel this is the prescription think about this this is a very very important point very important because a lot of coaches make this mistake they become i call this the prescription before the patient and i've explained this before it's like saying you know a doctor imagine if you go to a doctor and you go to their clinic and you hear that they have you know they have this board over there it says take this paracetamol okay then you take the next thing and then you take a syrup and then you do this okay and then you do an x-ray and it's all fixed everybody go through this i don't care how you feel i don't care what you think i don't care what your problems are but this is what you're going to take does this work does this even make sense so these are points to ponder think about this if you have a fixed exercise program for everybody who is so different women men age groups you know their uh, 
economic status, their recovery. Can you have a program the same for everyone? Think about this because this is an important point and you really have to understand because this will make you a better coach if you can understand this. So now coming to these points, okay, the differences, city upbringing exposure, a kid born and living in a city like Mumbai, okay, in South Mumbai and having, you know, grown up in a system compared to maybe a kid who's comes from a rural area, you know, and has a rural upbringing, lives in a small house, has never been to a big city, doesn't have the funding. Are they both the same? Can you treat them the same? Ask yourself, okay. Next becomes spending capability. Somebody whose parents can spend, you know, they are able to have a car, they are able to have a personal attendant for that kid and there's somebody else who just can't, who's so worried about now how they'll pay the rent for the room where they're staying. Can you have the same approach and the same load? I don't care. This is my program because I am this SNC coach. Make sense or not, ask yourselves. Okay, this is something where as coaches, we have to have not just a mind, we have to have a heart as well. And there has to be an understanding which comes in between. What do you want that kid? Do you have an understanding that's a different body, with different problems and different mind issues as well? So this is an important understanding and this is why I said individualism, if you can understand, you will become a better coach, helping people in exactly what they need. And not like I said the example of like an imaginary doctor who just says, this is my prescription. I'm just so great that I can write before your problems come in. I don't even need to know who you are. I just know this is it. And this is the same for all the thousands of people who train. So fixed programs, you have to really ask yourselves, if anybody has fixed programs that are meant for athletes, how do you do? Now, you might ask this question, how do you deal when you're handling a big, large number of kids, okay? Where there's people who are in, maybe, you know, you have 100 students that come into the gym and you have to look after them. How do you handle? There will be a, a point that I'll be discussing, so stay tuned, okay? I will be going through that point, how to handle large numbers and still apply the principle of individualism in that. Now also in this comes the next one in economic status, availability of sponsorship. An athlete who has sponsorship, who's, you know, who has the, his own or her own physiotherapist, whose uh, stay is sponsored, they definitely have less to worry about because they don't have to worry about where they're getting their next month's uh, payment from. So this makes a big difference on an athlete's uh, performance. If they can stay in a better room, you know, they can stay and travel in better conditions, it does make a difference, okay? It does definitely make a difference and we have to understand that this also can be different, okay? You will find athletes who will have a different approach to life and they have sponsorship versus somebody who can't afford. Next point, educational and reasoning abilities. This is understanding that we have to have. Athletes who are generally well-educated, uh, who have reasoning abilities, whom you can explain and they understand, it's different to somebody else who might not be that educated, who might have come from a background where they're physically gifted, but don't have that background of understanding. And many a times, the best athlete might not, need not be the most educated. Same goes with a technical coach. The best coach need not be the most educated. Many a times, and this is an interesting point, the sports science professional might be a lot more educated than the athlete or the coach. Now, what do we do there? Do we say that, hey, this guy is a PhD or this person's a PhD and they have their PhD in strength and conditioning or psychology or nutrition and they are just this level. So this athlete who doesn't know uh, about education should listen because this person has so much knowledge. What do you think? You have to understand here that the medal is given for the sport, the technical sport. The medal is not given for writing a thesis. Okay, again, harsh point sometimes, but we have to understand this. If you know that your knowledge has to ultimately help that athlete in their technical field, or if you're a psychologist for mentally, you've done your job. You could be the most clever and you could have been knowing hundreds of theories which are taught in universities, you might have invented something, you know, but can that help a athlete serve better or hit better or throw better? That's all that matters to them. The medals are given for those skills. 
So, this can again be a very um, uh, point where there is friction and sometimes you know there is sort of uh, problems that a lot of sports science professionals go through because they think like hey this makes so much sense you know this is how we train and they try to explain to the athlete or the coach okay and they just can't get their message through. What is the coach interested in? The coach is interested that my athlete should be physically stronger. If you can do that you have done a great job okay. The coach need not be a PhD. If he had time to study PhD okay then he would not have had time to uh, play sport and learn the skills. The coach knows the skills and knows what to do technically, tactically right and then the player also learns this and good players have this. They need not be you know somebody who has got a lot of uh, info which is theoretical. Important to understand this point okay and this will really help you if you are clear about this. Your sport education is important for you and then you have to know how to put that into something which helps the athlete in their technical and tactical or mental abilities okay. Otherwise this has no work here and many times a lot of clinical work that is in people who work in a clinic and do testing of athletes sometimes they find that on ground what happens is very different and a lot of coaches and athletes think that this person is yes he or she is so and so but they do not understand what we do and this person thinks like hey but I can see your problems and you should be doing this. So, there has to be that amalgamation of the two, the two has to match, this has to help okay because this is not very important. The player would have been winning before even the experienced sports science professional came into the field. So, this part is important okay, the sometimes the educational qualities of an athlete and the reasoning can help you make them understand better. But if they cannot understand what if they are not educated you still have to be able to explain that is your role. You cannot think that oh I am trying to explain and they do not understand then that means you are not teaching enough. You are not if they are not able to learn then you are not teaching the correct way to the person that is out there okay. Teaching has to ultimately go through like a filter for the right person. So, understand this part not every uh, athlete out there will be a PhD student to understand you know your logic, your science, your technical terms. They need not be, you have to make it as simple as possible okay. Next point is food culture okay. Food culture, uh, does everybody eat the same food? No, especially in a country as big as India with the amount of population we have, world's largest population now. So, can we expect that all Indians eat the same food? Obviously not. In the nutrition lectures you will get a lot of info on this but I am just going to briefly touch on this. Vegetarians a lot of times you will find that their protein content being low recovery can be less okay. Non-vegetarians some of them who eat great maybe some of them eat but not regularly they will probably eat a uh, lot lesser okay. Uh, then comes the problem of malnutrition and undernutrition. Malnutrition is when you do not get enough of the right nutrients, you are not getting the correct vitamins, you are not getting the correct minerals. You might be eating enough, you might be feeling full, you might even look probably you know somebody who is big but you could still be malnutrition because your diet does not have the right ingredients. Undernutrition is somebody who would have no choice because they just cannot afford to eat that much so they are undernutrition, they are not getting enough food okay. So, that is why you will find them generally to be very um, thin, very weak okay. So, these are two things which also we have to take into account. Somebody who cannot afford to eat much but is highly skilled, what do you do? Do you push them and say let us train harder and harder when you know that they are not able to get as much protein and as much carbs. So, we have to take all this into consideration. Food supplement usage okay. Some people are, some uh, athletes will be using food supplements so they know the value of using it. And they will if the, whether they are using it under prescription from a nutritionist or just by themselves just they have gone to a gym and somebody told them take this you know and then of course comes the aspect of safety there you know is it safe to take that. So, how are they doing it? Are they doing it with a proper qualified nutritionist or are they doing? So, this is also something to be taken into account. Uh, food culture in uh, the north, the north of India, south of India okay do they just eat the same? North Indians definitely have a lot more uh, calories and sometimes we say you know North Indian food is rich 
in uh, calories and of course it is you know it's very tasty as well of course and same goes with the south you know there are things which are very tasty you would like a masala dosa so an athlete eats but nutritionally where are these placed we have to sometimes understand this you know that eating is important good food is important northeast again when they eat it's important but we have to take into account that where they come from so that will give you an idea of how uh, they are structure wise okay now if you take a player generally from a region such as punjab and haryana very strong states with a strong uh, participation in sport uh, generally in the national games if you see or even international uh, teams there's always somebody from punjab or haryana and they'll generally be strong you look at them i always say this you know north indian athletes most of the time you don't have a problem with the physical side because their food habits are sort of such that you know they have strong structures most of the time again i can't generalize uh, sometimes somebody from maybe a state uh, such as maharashtra or rajasthan or uh, gujarat or maybe even other states again i'm not generalizing i'm just giving examples might have problems where they don't have the best protein amount that they take and they are not able to they don't look maybe as strong now can we train and say the same that hey i don't care which state you are from and i don't care what you eat i don't care what your parents do i want you to train like this does that make sense again food for thought we have to think this is food for thought so that we think about how we train people from these different regions okay so these are all these points which we have gone through and um, just to go over it again the main points age and gender differences the somatotypes as ectomorph mesomorph the muscular one like i said endomorphs and then there's the difference between your snc that is your fitness experience and your sport experience technically economic status food culture take all these into account when you're creating a program and like i said if you can look at that picture and look at that and realize that all these are different humans all these with different physical capacities different uh, life experiences and especially physical capacities because we deal with the physique as strength and conditioning coaches this will make you a better coach don't think that all humans are just the same and we have to just come there you know generalization doesn't work with human beings much okay we are not motors or machines where you just say that this happens and this is the law of physics which applies here okay it does help a lot in uh, the uh, tactical parts and uh, a lot with equipment but with humans we are individual this has to be understood okay thank you for listening and hope this lecture has really helped you a lot thanks